Welcome to American Variety Radio. I'm your host, Court Lewis. You know, every now and then, we do a show on American Variety in a series that I call Dog Days, and this is one of those days. My guest is Laura Vorrier, who's written a book called The Pet Sitter's Tale, about her career as a dog walker and pet sitter for the rich and or famous, I guess, in L.A. No, she does not name names, I'm sorry. But it is a lighthearted and funny and sometimes dismaying series of stories about an idealistic, nice young Midwestern woman trying to make a living in L.A., and maintain her self-esteem while befriending the dogs and cats and sometimes more exotic pets of people who are often not nearly as nice as their animals. So Laura isn't just a solo dog walker. She's an entrepreneur who owns a pet care company called Your Dog's Best Friend, which employs a number of dog walkers and pet sitters. Welcome, Laura. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Thank you, Court. I'm glad to be on. (laughs) Glad to have given it. (laughs) Laura's uh, joining us from California, uh, where it's actually uh, pretty early in the morning out there, so I appreciate that. Well, I understand from your book, you actually pioneered the dog walking industry in Hollywood over 15 years ago. How'd that come about, Laura? Uh, Accidentally. I certainly didn't uh, set out to do that court. I moved from Chicago to Los Angeles uh, to be a makeup artist, and I really wanted to be uh, a makeup artist that was, you know, collecting awards at uh, film and television, and I just failed miserably at that, and I, (laughs) I stumbled into dog walking and pet sitting. You mean you actually went to Hollywood with a dream and and didn't achieve your dream? Come on, that never happens. (laughs) Imagine that. Really? How novel. Uh, (laughs) Right. Well, what was I thinking? You know, when you look back at some of these thoughts and ideas that you had, you know, I I had a dream, but I, I didn't have, I guess, a very good plan. So, yeah, no, I went out to L.A. as a makeup artist, and I had been a makeup artist in Chicago, so I think that's important. I didn't just mm. say, I'm going to go out to L.A. and be a famous actor. Sure. Um, but, you know, I was a makeup artist. I was doing pretty well, you know, I'd say, and I thought this is a good time to move to L.A. I'm still full of youthful enthusiasm, and, and I can do it. And I just went out there and, you know, got my butt handed to me and wound up being a dog walker and made the best of it. So it all worked out for me. Right, so that's not an obvious transition, but you were able to kind of smoothly move from one dream to the next. And how did it actually happen? What was the segue or the transition? I, I, I'll tell you, it, it's still interesting to me to this day. And I, I do have to reach out to Paula Poundstone because I think she still doesn't know that this all happened. But <laughs> I was working at a retail department store called Barney's New York, which is a pretty very shishi department store in Beverly Hills on Wilshire Boulevard. And a young woman and I got to talking. She had had a little dog that had an accident in the department store, and I had helped her with that. We got to talking. It turned out she needed her makeup done on a, on a small film set, and I agreed to do it. And while I was on the set and doing her makeup, she had to go and have the shoot done, and her little dog, Abby, was there. And she said, do you, do you mind walking Abby while I'm on the set? You can't come. You don't have a union card. But Abby loves you, and I don't want her to do her business in the trailer. Do you mind? And I said, yes, I'll absolutely do it. She said, I'll, I'll pay you. I said, okay, great. I love the dog. I love dogs. So I started walking around the lot with her dog, and I'm, you know, focused on what am I going to do, what, what's going to become of me, you know. And I'm walking the dog, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, like, sturdiest about walking the dog and making sure she does her business. And out of this other trailer, I see this woman coming down the steps, and I look, and I see it's, it's Paula Poundstone. And I said, oh, gosh, Laura, don't say anything. Don't make eye contact. Just keep, you know, just keep going. She comes right over to me and the dog. And she says, hey, you know, what, what, a, what a cute dog. And I said, yes, thank you. He's very cute. And she said, hey, are, are you a professional dog walker? And I said, oh, my gosh, this is my moment. I can picture on being a makeup artist, and <laughs> that's going to go nowhere. I know it. Or I can just say yes to this nice lady. And I said, yes, I'm a professional dog walker. And she said, great. I need to hire you. And I thought, oh, my God, here it goes. So that was how it started. And, you know, it just organically evolved from that. I walked <laughs> Paula's dog and then her neighbor's dog and then her friend's neighbor's dog and then her agent's dog. And then it, it just it just my phone literally started ringing off the hook after that, literally. Well, there was a pent-up demand that nobody had met, and uh, you basically, uh, like anything in life, uh, success often subsists of uh, a door opening in front of you, and you walk through it, and there you are. So, Right place, right time. I wish, you know, looking back, of course, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I see what's now this modern day with, you know, on-demand dog walking apps and these huge companies that got enormous VC, you know, Rover.com and Wag.com and all these you know, dogvacay.com, you know, I, I was, mm. what was I thinking? I mean, I was just happy to have the little piece of business that I had. And then the, the to me, like a, a little mid-sized business, um, I wasn't thinking like on this big, you know, national scale, which I now looking back, I, I think I should have been thinking that. So, 
So it's obvious what a dog walking surface is, but how far does pet sitting go? I mean, how often is it overnight or even longer, and how do you manage moving temporarily into someone else's house? For overnights, I say that's about 50% of the pet sitting because most people, instead of just having visits, they will want someone to come over and stay in their house and make sure that the dog has company, especially overnight. So about 50% of the time, you would sleep over at the clients. And then for me, uh, making that easy, it's all about creating that system of packing into a client and packing out and also creating a list. So when you leave, you don't forget anything. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, we have two dogs, and my wife and I, and, and we, in addition to a horse and some donkeys, and so we, <laughs> we, we seldom anymore take trips together. It's like one or the other. But uh, but even when it was just two dogs, I think of them as being like a fifth of a child. You know, you're kind of, there's a lot of packing involved. You either have to take them with you or have to figure out a way to put them in a kennel that you trust and all that stuff. So it's complicated with uh, with pets, and I can certainly understand the demand for people to have you stay overnight and uh, or longer sometimes. Well, you talk in your book, Laura, and I mentioned it in my intro, about having self-esteem issues when you first started with basically being, I guess to put it bluntly, a servant to other people's animals, right? So give some examples, if you would, of the extremes of the ways that people treated you in that role in the beginning. And I mean both good and bad. You know, that, that's an interesting question. I was giving it some thought. People treat you like a servant in the beginning, and, and I think... To a, a degree you are, you're getting paid to do something, and that's the verbal contract or sometimes written contract that you are supplying a service, and they treat you like that. So there's no niceties. There's no really any kindness or friendship, but that's sort of an anomaly in my business when you have a relationship with a client, you have the keys to their house, you're snuggling with their dog, they treat you like a friend mostly and, and they love you and, and they trust you and they're trusting you with their, you know, their furry child. So I think in the beginning, the self-esteem issue had to do, do with, you know, just observing other people's wealth in LA, something that I had never really been privy to back growing up in like middle class Chicago. Um, so it, it did bother me, but I got over it rather quickly, I think. Well, it is, you know, really a service industry, so it's kind of, but it's a personal service industry, you know, so it's kind of like having a housekeeper, you know, and you can judge people's character by, well, let's say in a restaurant, how they treat the wait staff, if they're friendly to them or if they're curt to them, you know, you can kind of tell what people are like by the way they treat people that they can get away with being rude to if they want to. So that's kind of a similar thing, and I'm glad to hear that most people who entrust their beloved pets to you, treat you like a friend because they kind of invite you into the family at the same time, I guess, to some extent. Well, so talking about being in L.A. and the rich and famous and so on, what percentage of your clientele are celebrities, Is it, uh, or is it mainly just normal working people who can afford this kind of service? This is interesting. This is something I think a lot of people outside of the Hollywood bubble don't even realize, but it's not just celebrities that are wealthy. It's the people that made the celebrities the celebrities they are. So mm -hmm. I'd say it's a very small percentage of my clientele that is celebrities, but it is a large percentage of my clients that are celebrity handlers, if you will, so the agents. So if you think a celebrity has got money, imagine what their agent has. Mm -hmm. um, you know, So it's the agents, it's the attorneys, it's the stylist. It's the therapist. It's, you know, all the people that are in Hollywood, um, a lot of those people. And, you know, when you're hiring pet sitters and people that come stay over your house overnight and the limo's picking up your dog at the airport, you know, you're not worried about money and you're doing good. So I think that percentage is maybe 80%. And less than 5% on the celebrities and the other just people who aren't in the industry but just are in a position where they really have to be able to afford someone to watch their dog or they put it in their budget because they know how important it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like daycare in a way. So Absolutely, yeah, it is, it's exactly like daycare, sure. Well, I asked you know, a minute ago for maybe an example of uh, ways that people have treated you both good and bad. So kind of pick one, good or bad, and give us an example, a little story. Oh, well, I'll tell you a great story. I don't know if you remember who Tom Bosley was. He was the dad on Happy Days. They were, him and his wife were great clients of mine, and they had a dog named Angel, and boy, she was a beautiful dog, a uh, golden retriever, and she was such a smiley, beautiful dog, and they treated me like a daughter, and it was wonderful. I stayed at their home in Bel Air, and I got to go on these great adventures with Angel, and come Christmas time, 
they had given me this framed picture in a beautiful silver frame of me and Angel together on a particularly rainy day in L.A. And they had bought Angel a yellow raincoat and they had given me a matching yellow raincoat and they mm. took my picture by the Christmas tree. And it was just such a nice gesture. I got to tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that picture of me and Angel. So I, I think, you know, and they were just the nicest, kindest people and a gorgeous house and a beautiful dog. And, you know, to this day, I, I really do cherish that, cherish that memory. Well, you have so many stories in your book. Uh, one I remember was um, a woman who, I guess a client who hired a pet psychic who uh, read her dog's, uh, feelings and, and innermost secrets and uh and you were the pet sitter for the for the client and so they invited you in to a meeting with uh, the four of you including the dog so why don't you just tell us about that quickly yes so i went to a client a client was torn between taking her dog with and leaving her her dog behind with me uh she was going overseas and when i got to her house to kind of talk about things unexpectedly there was a pet psychic there and the psychic was going to guide my client down the road of, you know, what she should do and sort of get some insights from the dog herself. And uh, what happened was uh, the psychic, you know, guided my client right into using her services over mine for uh, her trip overseas. So that, that's, you know, in a nutshell what happened. But there was a whole conversation about what the psychic thought that I had done to the dog, but in mm. a previous lifetime. Yes. In a previous lifetime, you had, you had been bad to the dog, and and, no. uh, and, and the, the client believed that. And, and then, as you say, the the uh, pet psychic turned out to have a side business as a dog uh, pet sitter. So there you went. I know. Unbelievable. <laughs> Weird sales job. What's the uh, oddest instruction you've ever received from a, a client? I had a client who lived in the Hollywood Hills, and they had six little chihuahuas. This family loved chihuahuas. And they had a big yard and a big hill on the side of the yard. And I was sleeping over. They were going overseas, and I was going to be there for 10 days. And the man took me aside and said, there's there's a bunch of frozen chickens in my freezer, and every night I want you to go outside and, and, and throw one of these chickens over the fence at the top of the hill. <laughs> and I said, um okay. And he said, I give it to the coyotes because if I feed them the chickens, they won't eat the dogs. So be sure every night that you throw a chicken out, I'll leave you extra money. Go get, go get more chickens. At the end of the trip, these chickens will be out. So get more chickens. But you know, I went to bed that first night and I thought, Oh, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's not going to happen. But that night, I heard the coyotes all night, and I kept thinking, okay, tomorrow morning, as soon as I wake up, I'm going to hurl the chicken over the fence, because maybe there is some unspoken deal between the yeah. coyotes and this guy that, hey, you give us the chickens, we won't eat your chihuahuas. And that was, I think, for me, just throwing these frozen chickens over this guy's fence was probably the weirdest instruction I've, I've received. And, of course, he had attracted the uh, coyotes down there, and the entire pack was uh, thoroughly used to g gathering <laughs> yeah, it. Chicken. Gathering at the appointed hour by the spot by the fence and getting their their chicken out of heaven. I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> Where's the chicken? Where's the chicken? <laughs> Surprised they didn't climb the fence and find an open window or something. Well, there was one. You know, I'll just recap it briefly. There was one in your in your book. Uh, another story, kind of about an odd client request, where the client wanted the dog to be fed two times a day at a precise time, exactly thirty five pieces of veterinarian prescribed dog kibble, fed at a certain temperature by hand. And you had to do that one by one to get the dog these things. Anyway, you, you, you ended that by saying, do you recall this? Uh, you didn't tell him that the dog did what? <laughs> that I had seen the dog eat its own poop. <laughs> there you go. So, it was, wasn't that finicky after all. <laughs> anyway. It really wasn't. And, you know, I talk about clients treating you badly. I'll just remember, you know, the client was like 35 kibbles. And I said, okay. And she said, okay, we'll count the kibbles out. And I, I said, well, do you need me to count the 30? Yes, count the kibbles. I said, oh, my gosh. I'm, does the client not think I can count to 35? I mean, these are some of the things that you're like, I, seriously, we're oh, both going yeah. to waste our time. I'm going to count out 35 kibbles. But I did. I just yeah. remember. She's like, now that's what 35 kibbles looks like. I said, okay, that's what 35 kibbles look like. <laughs> the customer's always right, even when they're crazy. <laughs> that's right. So what are you going to do? Do uh, clients demand frequent check-ins on your part or the part of your employees? I mean, do they, like, want to watch you and your pets on their smartphone, that kind of thing? Oh, yes. This is uh, the future. You know, people can watch you, and that's a conversation that I've gotten used to having is asking people straight up, you know, do you have cameras in your house? Because the expectation of privacy is long gone, mm. and 
I feel if I'm not uh, straight forward with my clients and say, do, do you have cameras in your house? Uh, they usually won't tell us, which, which is the legal. So um, I tell everyone that I hire right now, don't do anything you would want to see yourself doing in a court of law in front of a group of your peers. Mm -hmm. You know, so yes, people do expect that. And, you know, I used to leave written report cards for clients and they'd come home from work and they'd see their dog had a great walk. But now we do real-time texting of the dogs on the walks. And, you know, that solves for a couple things. Did you walk my dog, and is my dog okay? And, you know, I have people who text me all the time, God, I live for these pictures. Thank you so much. They really make my day. So it's a, it's a, it's a valuable added bonus to the time of technology. You're listening to American Variety Radio. I'm your host, Court Lewis. We're talking with Laura Voyer, who is the author of the book called The Pet Sitter's Tale. And she is someone who runs a pet care company called Your Dog's Best Friend out in L.A. and uh, does, you know, dog walking and pet sitting and uh, does it on a fairly large scale with her company. Laura, over the past 20 or 30 years, I mean, it's obvious that people have come to focus more and more of their attention and affection on their pets than they ever did in the past to the point that they're more and more like actual children. So do you find that some people are really just over the top in how they treat their pets and how they want you to treat them? I think we've already given some examples that sort of, sort of answer that question in part, but are some people just almost nuts about it? In my observation and in my experience, it is people that don't have human kids who really spend a lot and think a lot about the health and, and the emotional health and, and the quality of life of their furry children. Hmm. And they put a lot of expectations on them. You know, I had a client, a single woman who had two dogs and she put one in a baby carrier and they were in the stroller and they got dressed up and the one dog was having anxiety and she took it to the vet and the vet said, you know what, you're putting too much expectation on your dog. Your dog is picking up on the energy. <laughs> and she actually, you know, gave the dog a prescription for anxiety no, no. Uh, because of it. So it's really extreme in some cases. And yes, you know, as we become more disconnected as a society and as communities, I think we, we tend to anamorphize our animals and just love them like we would the human being that we wish we had in our life or instead of the human being. Yeah, that's definitely true. I see that sometimes. So, you know, we talked about a couple of the crazy requests uh, the clients have made on you. Have you ever just said no? <laughs> no. I mean, I, I haven't. And this is the real reason why. And I think this is partly to do with an entrepreneur. The one time you say no is they find somebody else to do it. So it's really... It's difficult to say no. I, I I can't even have a situation that comes to mind where I flat out said no hmm. to client for any request because you might not get a chance again. Well, it comes with the territory with your business, I guess, that you're going to have a lot of sort of extreme sort of situations and requests. And I guess you, again, as we said earlier, the client is always right, even if they're crazy. So several years ago, for those who've been watching TV for more than a few years, Caesar Milan's uh, show, The Dog Whisperer was the most watched show on TV, and it was obvious to me that the owners, in most cases, had no idea how to manage a dog's behavior and usually had made themselves subordinate to the dog where the dog was running roughshod over them. Do you see that kind of thing a lot? I love that term, roughshod. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely, I do. But LA is pretty cosmopolitan, and we're pretty wise to Caesar's ways. I don't think that I see it as much now as... You know, I did back maybe 15 years ago where people aren't aware of being the alpha to their dog and making sure that the dog knows they're the leader. And also now everybody understands that the dog is picking up our energy. So if we are calm and focused and we're not yelling and, and the having, you know, all these crazy moments, I think the dogs will mostly stay calm and they'll pick up on that energy. And, you know, they feel that energy from the leash. If you're gripping on the leash and you're scared because they're about to approach another dog or, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're feeling anxious, they know it. So I absolutely feel that now in these days and times, people are kind of, the, the gig is up, you know, they, they know what they have to do with their dog to make their dog have the right behaviors. Well, that's good to hear. So shout out to you, Cesar Milan, wherever you are, that uh, that your message got through apparently to the whole country. The bottom line Absolutely. message that you, I think it has. that you Absolutely. have to be you have to be in charge and you have to be the leader. You're the pack leader, and uh, don't let the dog be, or you'll you'll never get past it. I mentioned uh, in the beginning, Laura, that you've dealt with more exotic pets than dogs and cats. So what are some of those? Uh, a llama. That's a very exotic. A llama. I uh, didn't interact with the llama too much, just food and water as as needed basis. Uh, and a pot belly pig, a Vietnamese pot belly pig. And I know you had had a, an intense show about these pigs not too long ago. That's right. Yep. Vietnamese pot belly pig. It was a rescue organization in North Carolina for them. 
What else? Have you ever had to walk a snake or anything like that? <laughs> you know, I don't love the snakes, but I have taken care of the rodents and the lizards and a lot of different uh, animals. I, I went to t- took care of a guinea pig, and the people were gone for a long time, and they said, you know, we'll give you a little extra money. Do you mind cleaning out its crate on the last day? And I said, oh, fine, it's fine. So I, I never cleaned a guinea pig's crate before, but the, the main problem was what am I going to do with the guinea pigs? So I went and got an empty shoebox, and I, I stuck them in the shoebox, and I said, I'm going to do this fast. And then I changed the paper in the water and all that good stuff. Did it really fast. <laughs> and then I went to get the shoebox. I opened the shoebox, empty. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, where no. Where did it go? Oh, my gosh. And, of course, I had another client, and I was running late. And I was just looking everywhere for this darn <laughs> Guinea pig, I finally found him. I was like, get over here. And initially, I was scared to pick him up. But when I finally found him, I just grabbed him and stuck him in his crate. I like, bye. Oh, got to go. <laughs> Golly. Well, at least he didn't run and hide under every couch and, you know, make you crawl around and move furniture and oh, so on. Oh, it wasn't easy to find him. <laughs> oh, wow. That's wild. So we mentioned, uh, you know, your employees, and uh, as in any service industry, that can be quite tricky. So how hard is it in your business to find good employees? I'd say just like any other business. I mean, dog walking isn't very glamorous. You're not going to make a ton of money. So it it has to be a person who loves dogs. They just have to love dogs. It has to be almost somebody that would do it even for free. And that's ideal when people tell me, oh, I do it for free. I say, oh, you're hired. (laughs) And I'm not going to pay you. So (laughs) wish came true. Uh, So I think it is hard. Yes, it's hard. Just like any job, you have to find people that are committed and people that are interested. Hey, you've definitely got uh, some some hair-raising horror stories in your book about uh, about employees who, uh, you know, start off uh, seeming and sounding good and then uh, go south fast. Uh, maybe tell us one of those. I assume the names have been changed to protect the guilty, right? So. Absolutely. She was a young woman who I was mentoring, and she was full of bright eyes, and she had this degree from UCLA in business, and I thought we were going to be partners, and she was just... You know, she was every employer's dream, just enthusiastic and knowledgeable and loving towards the dogs and, you know, just by all outward appearances, lovely. And she wound up stealing my business from me. You know, my heart pounds a little when I say it. It was so undermined and shocking. To this day, the biggest sort of transgression that I have seen from people that I hire as dog walkers is stealing the clients. And that is so hurtful and it's... It's so unethical. It's still shocking, but it's happened twice in big ways that they were able to actually have some some penetration of my market share. And then other little times that people just, you know, ripped off my logo or tried to write bad reviews on Yelp. But, yeah, it's the employees. Yeah, you describe some who um, who pretend to do the service but don't and will leave notes. Uh, you know, they did such and such at such and such a time and they didn't and... And yet, in one case, the client, uh, unbeknownst to the uh, pet sitter, was was working upstairs and working from home that day, and they knew exactly what the woman had done. And, oh, and, that was horrible. That yeah. was horrible. And to have a client call you with that information, and you just have no idea that that's coming, that's just a real bad feeling. Uh, yeah. So I had a, a dog walker who went to a client's house, made a sandwich, had the sandwich, wrote a note, told the client, great walk, love your dog. And the whole time, the client was upstairs working from home in knew what was going on that's not a good feeling you know when somebody Mm. calls you and says somebody that you basically entrust with you know that client's animal has lied yeah so there are lots of ways to lose your clients that are out of your control that's a kind of a risk then so (laughs) that's the name of my next book (laughs) (laughs) might be too long a title i don't know make it a subtitle (laughs) anyway you're welcome to it so switching gears a little bit, we've uh, twice adopted standard poodle puppies, you know, perfectly healthy, fine puppies from people who basically had bought them from a breeder but were totally unprepared to deal with a puppy, right? So within a few days, they're like frantic to get rid of this thing that won't sleep at night and is chewing their furniture and peeing on the carpet and so on. So what advice can you give to people who just got a puppy and can't afford a pet sitter to come into their house every day while the family's at work or school? I mean, should the puppy be crate trained or what advice do you give? First, congratulations on those standard poodle puppies. A shout out to breed specific rescues because you can get basically anything that you want that you would maybe in earlier days gotten from a breeder from a rescue and for exactly that reason because people underestimate what it takes to raise a puppy. Yes, definitely crate train your puppy and, you know, just set yourself up for for success. Don't get a puppy on a whim. You know, make sure you put some thought into it and you have all the supplies you need, such as a crate and 
the puppy food and the toys to distract the puppy and the energy to take the puppy out on walks and, you know, the patience to train the puppy. So definitely I say be prepared if you're going to get a puppy because we always underestimate how much energy they actually have. And how long it takes. And, you know, you have to be willing and able to come home at lunch or have a neighbor do that or a friend do that. I mean, for a time, it's like having a baby, right? They take a lot Absolutely. It's like having a baby, but this baby you can put in a crate for a little bit, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, People always tell me, gosh, when is the puppy going to sleep through the night? You know, it takes a hot minute to get your puppy to be, you know, that perfect dog that you always envisioned. But I think it's worth it to stay the path and just, you know, get some help. Like you said, for crate training, you know, have somebody come during the day. You can't just get a puppy and say, I'll see you in 12 hours. It doesn't Mm -hmm. work like that. Mm -hmm. You really have to get that puppy out and create the time that it knows and the place that it knows to to relieve itself so it gets trained faster like that. It takes six months anyway and even longer sometimes. So we're getting toward the end of the show. Let me ask you this question. Has the image of dog walking as a profession improved over the 15-plus years that you've been doing it? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Somebody has just sent me an article saying that uh, it's harder to become a professional dog walker in Hollywood than it is to get into a uh, top 10 university. And I said, whoa, what? <laughs> yeah. That seems that seems weird. But yes, it has. I think that people really do view it now as more as a professional profession and as a way to make a legitimate um, a salary. Because in this gig economy, you know, so many of our side gigs turn into full time gigs, as you know. And so I do think people do see it now more as a profession. Absolutely. Yeah, so people, young people that you hired don't have the self-esteem issues that you had going into it where, oh gosh, I'm somebody who picks up dog poop. They don't, they don't have that feeling. It's more like this is really a legitimate job, huh? Absolutely. And you know what? I think people start to realize, you know, there's a little bit of poop in every business, Mm. you know? So you, (laughs) you gotta, uh, choose your poison here. And if all you have to do is pick up a little poop, but you get to hang out with the dogs and you get to have fun with the pets, you know, that's somebody's dream job. It certainly is mine. <laughs> Into every life comes a little poop. So. Right. All right. So maybe last question for you. What should anybody who wants to get into the pet care business need to consider first? Figure out how much you love pets and how much you're committed to it. So if you love pets and you are committed to it, then I say educate yourself. That's so important. You know, learn first aid, CPR, you know, learn a bit about the different breeds and start where you're at. You don't really have to have too much formal education to be a successful pet sitter and and dog walker. You just have to know what you're doing and listen to the client. And what about the business aspect of it, of actually uh, getting into a business, which means hiring other people like you've done? That's a whole different level. You know, that takes a minute. I would say there's a couple different business models. You either hire people right off the start, and that's business 101, or, you know, you do it and then only take on employees as needed. So it depends on which kind of business model you want to follow. But, you know, hiring employees can be the undoing of your company. I know people who started when I started, and they've never hired it out, not one time. So Hmm. it's really up to you how big or small you want your business to be. Well, the book is The Pet Sitter's Tale by Laura Vorrier. You can buy it at Amazon and Barnes and Noble online or in the bookstores at Barnes and Noble. Laura's website is thepetsitterstale.com. So one word spelled like it sounds, thepetsitterstale.com. And you can sign up there for her newsletter or even email her personally. You can also look uh, Laura up on YouTube and, uh, and see her in interviews like this, but on TV and that kind of thing. So her last name is spelled, uh, V-O-R-R-E-Y-E-R, pronounced Vorier. Laura, it's been fascinating. Enjoyed having you on. It's been fun to talk with you. Thank you so much, Court. It was my pleasure. And thanks to all of you for listening. I hope you'll tune in again next week, same time, same place, for more American Variety Radio.